we're going to have three short presentations today. The way we're going to do it is that um, me and, and, and Kenyon Adams, who's here, who's uh, a senior fellow at the Hunter Rent Center, uh, amongst many other things, and an artist, an interdisciplinary artist, are going to give two short talks, about 15 minutes each, uh, and then do a little discussion and Q&A for a little bit. And then um, uh, Richard Zaru from Bard Early College, so it's a Bard-themed panel. Um, uh, is gonna, he's a musician and composer, and he's going to come and talk about um, John Cage. It's, it's, it's related, but a little different, so we thought we'd separate them and give a chance for questions along these two panels first. Uh, so, so great. Uh, I, I'm going to talk to you about freedom and meaning. Um, these, when, when I run the Hannah Arendt Center, and when people ask me, well, what, who is Hannah Arendt, or what is Hannah Arendt about, I'll say that there's two primary, two controlling, or not controlling, two really amazing thought ideas in her work. One is what she says about freedom, and one is what she says about meaning. And I'm going to try and bring those two together today, because I think they fit together. Um, human freedom, uh, Alan asked, you know, before I said that uh, we don't know what is freedom, right? Is, you know, we asked, how, what, how is freedom work? Well, Arendt is interested in a specific kind of freedom. And first of all, it's human freedom. What does it mean to be freedom as a human being? Um, and she, what she says is, it does not mean to be alive, right? Because plants are alive, let alone animals. Maybe sometimes the earth is alive. Uh, so, so being alive is not important to being human. Nor is even you know, having a job or, or having a house. Lots of other uh, animals work or labor. Um, for her, uh, freedom is to live a meaningful life. And that's what she thinks is unique about human beings. Um, there's, a cabbie, there's, a, there's a corollary of this, which will, is always shocks people, which is that Hannah Arendt was therefore a real a critic of human rights. Because to the extent that human rights seeks to keep people alive, and do so even by putting them in camps and and in a sense, making them like animals, in her mind, um, she thinks human rights is inhuman. And she says there's only one truly human right, which is the right to speak and act in public in the ways that matter. And the first part of that, to speak and act in public, is what she means by freedom, by human freedom. To be free is to act. The second part, meaning, or to, in ways that matter, is that to be free is to act in ways that allow you to matter, to be taken seriously, so that when you speak and act, people will respond to you. Now, they can ignore you, they can kill you, they can imprison you, or they can tell a story about you. And when they tell stories about you, that's when you, your life becomes immortal. It lasts and becomes part of the world, the common world that we all share, and that's when you become meaningful. So first, let me talk a little bit more about what she means by freedom. Freedom for her is, I said, the freedom to act. Um, it's the freedom uh, that Brutus expresses in, in Julius uh, Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, when Brutus responds to Cassius uh, and says, finally decides he will join the plot and says that this should be or we will fall for it. It's a risk. To be free is to act, to take a risk, to do something new, the decision to kill Caesar. Um, it's to be spontaneous, a word we've heard a number of times today. It's to do the unexpected. Why? Why is that what freedom is? Because only if you do something new, if you do something unexpected, will people tell stories about you. If you do what everyone else does, you'll be ignored. So you have to do something new in the world in order to um, have people tell stories about you and thus be human and be meaningful. Um, we, thus, to act means to initiate, to birth something, to birth a new thing into the world, whether it's an assassination or a state or a new institution, or something like the, Al the Alpine Fellowship. When you birth something new into the world, you've acted. 
and um, once you've acted, uh, people can respond. The second step, or the second thing I want to say about freedom, is that if freedom is an action, for our end, human freedom is also always political. Political, not in the sense that it means you're a, you're a governor or a congressman or a dictator or whatever, but it's that you act with others. So polit politics, she defines as the f acting in concert with others. And to be free, she says, is to act. To act and to be free are the same. Um, Stephen mentioned this earlier. Action, thus, is not about pursuing your interests. It's about inter esse, being between, being amongst others. And so freedom as action is interesse. interesse. It's about being amongst and with others. Now, if you're going to act, and you're going to act amongst others, you want them to attend to you. You want them to pay attention to you. And thus, action and freedom require what she calls virtuosity, or excellence, takes this from Machiavelli. And thus, she says, human political freedom has a lot in common with performing arts. You can't be a good political actor if you don't know how to make people pay attention to you. Um, and thus, uh, political action requires not only virtuosity on your part, but it requires spectators or judges and audience. If you're going to have political action, freedom, which is a kind of action in concert with others, which depends on virtuosity, you need a space, you need a stage, you need a place in which to act, a theater, or an amphitheater, or whatever it is. And that RN calls the space of appearances, or politics, or the political space. She says that every polis, a political community, requires a space in which people come together and you can act people in a place that people will see you, hear you, and attend to you. There's a famous line she has in her book, The Human Condition, wherever you go, you will be a polis. It's actually a quote from Aristotle. It, it, the polis doesn't depend on the land you're on or anything. It depends on having a space to act. The word, our word politics, which comes from the Greek um, polis or politeia, um, comes from the Greek verb pelein, which is a crazy verb. It's not widely used, but it, it's the word the Greeks used to describe smoke rings coming up from a peace pipe. That's the root of politics. Why? The politician is the person who stands in the middle amidst the plurality of different people and speaks in such a way that the people who are different around them recognize that they share something in common. The politician is that person who speaks what is common and thus gathers the people in the circles around them. So if freedom is a kind of action which depends upon virtuos virtuosity, and requires a political space, freedom requires courage. Courage, Arendt says, is the first political virtue, the cardinal virtue of politics. Because if you're going to act in public in ways that are new and different, you're either going to be seen as a criminal and killed, think of Socrates or Jesus, or you're going to be ignored, which means you didn't have a certain virtuosity. Or you can build something new. And thus, action, freedom, requires that you not care too much about your life. It requires that you not care too much if you live or die. You have to risk acting not for your life or your security or your happiness, but for the world. You have, to, you have to think, I'm risking my life because the world that I want to make meaningful 
the world I want to help bring about is worth it. How does one separate oneself from the already existing world and say something new? And this is where Kenyon and my presentations will overlap a bit. It's in solitude. The precondition for the freedom of politics is having a space of solitude where you can be a jerk, where you can have prejudices, where you can develop your own private, unique perspective on the world. You then have to learn how to integrate that private, unique perspective into a public world in a way that's virtuous so that people respond to you. If not, you're an insane hermit crying into the, wood, into the, into the wind. The freedom to act in public and courageously express your opinions is the freedom to be judged. And this is the way you integrate yourself in the world. It depends upon a world that already exists, that came before us and will exist after us, that outlasts us. And political action, free action, is about trying to say something new that will take the already existing world and make it different, change it. And Arendt argues that this depends upon what she calls the imagination, what she borrows from Kant. The imagination is the enlarged mentality. It's my ability to think from the perspective of all of you. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And to test my own thoughts and opinions on from your perspective, what would you, you know, I may think we should kill all the Jews, but what would you think? What would you think? And how does that impact me? And I have to find a way to woo you to my opinions. That's the technical term that she uses. We need to woo others to us. And this wooing, which has a virtuosity, and I think even a erotic element to it, a seduction, exactly, um, is what she calls judging. Judging is learning to take your opinion, test it through public interaction with as many perspectives, and then seek to woo others. And if you're successful in that wooing, you change the world. That's what freedom and politics um, means for her. So in judging, you have to overcome your egoism. You can only judge as a member of a community. Um, we were just talking at lunch about desire and responsibility. You need to take your, your own opinions, your own desires, and woo people to them in a way that fits them within the common sense of the community. And this brings me to the second part. Um, so Arendt argues that in both art and in politics, the spectators are more important than the actors. It's an extraordinary claim, right? The French Revolution was made not by the people who acted in it, by the people who then told the story afterwards. I mean, it's, it's, in a way, it's a common thing. You know, history is written by the winners, right? It's the people who tell the story. But it does raise the question then of the relationship between art and politics. Um, and for her, the historian slash the artist is in many ways the quintessential political actor. The, the artist, the spectators, the judges need the actors and the actors need the judges. Another way of saying this is that all art is also action. Um, I think that's, that's what I wanted to say in 15 minutes. And um, you, the art, the, I'll just summarize it in this way. For Arendt, you need a space of solitude in order to become who you are, to have an original opinion. You need to be allowed to be crude and prejudiced and make mistakes and joke and do things that many of us are not allowed to do anymore because everything is recorded and everything is seen. 
And you need that space of privacy so that you become a unique person, a pluralist person, a plural person, who can then enter a world with others. And you need a space of appearance where you can then act and hopefully be taken seriously. And thus, impact the world in such that people will talk about you, either in good or bad ways, and you have to have the courage to do that. And then you need people who judge and are willing to judge and tell stories and build a common world. That is what she means by freedom as human freedom, all together. So I'll stop there. And now Kenyon is gonna come up and talk about solitude and then we'll, we'll, the two of us will talk a little bit with you all. And then uh, Richard will come up after that. I really hope that my life continues to be a place where conversations with Roger are just like a standard thing. A bit of shared solitude. Thank you, Roger, for your long-term commitment to this kind of way of seeing and living. Okay, so I'm Kenyon. Kenyon Adams. I'm an interdisciplinary artist uh, and creative director. Um, it's important to say interdisciplinary because when I show up, it gets really interdisciplinary. <laughs> so I try to let people understand what's about to go down. Um, not today, but beware. Next time. Um, so I work at the intersections of the visual, literary, and performing arts. I've had the thrill to work with hundreds of artists and on um, lots of different projects. Um, much of my artistic work, though, has been aligned with um, liberation movements. Liberation, uh, particularly black liberation, meaning the work of making or setting free, which involves naming and opposing systems of domination. Domination. That gives a little <laughs> feedback. Yes. This attention has continually uh, given me a sense of how few people actually experience freedom and the ways in which the work of liberation can feel perennial, relegated to the most vulnerable, and ultimately unsustainable. It's striking to consider that the impetus and the goals of some of the great freedom movements of the mid-century uh, they revolved around a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Think about James Baldwin's Notes of a Native Son. Goes into the diner. What do you want? What do you think we want? A cup of coffee and a hamburger. And then the riot that actually ensued. And just hold that riot, that violence, against the cup of coffee and the hamburger. Or, or the, the bus seat taken by a seamstress that is now of, of lore. Uh, really kicked off a global liberation movement. Um, in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, so the site of liberation and the experience of freedom is often located in the quotidian. I want to just briefly share about a project and brand that's become central to my thinking and making in the world and looking for collaborators, partners, and co-conspirators. It's called Future Solitude. That's the word up there in pink. Um, Future Solitude is a multidisciplinary platform that responds to the notion that solitude is a human right and one that's necessary for formation of self, for the enjoyment of citizenship, for uh, the sustaining of a sense of subjectivity, subjecthood. Uh, it includes, Future Solitude, it, it includes an art series which started this last year, premiered in Austin, Texas at the Fusebox Festival. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an ongoing residency including other artists and collaborative projects that develop new works also at the intersection of photography, text, and performance. So the first sort of interdisciplinary issue of Future Solitude called The Bearing of Witness and the Giving of Testimony includes new music, a collection of photographs, and a trio of curated dance works. Future Solitude also serves as a brand consultant to industry leaders about the ways in which black and brown bodies and the bodies of difference in general are depicted and the narratives implied in those images, particularly in relation to solitude and subject formation. So the project has a three-point origin story, which I'll share since we just have a little bit of time. One has to do with my hair. The second, my grandfather's funeral. And then the third, um, my sort of experience in solitude and quarantine uh, in Brooklyn 2020. 
a family photo, let's say. Um, so my hair. Um, people often, you know, make comments about my hair. Some of these comments are less, <laughs> I could do without them. But there's, there's often something that people want to say. Usually it's, uh, you know, in the realm of something reasonably uh, <laughs> that I'm willing to tolerate. But, uh, you know, they say, how did you get your hair like this? You know, what did you do? And, you know, very early on, because um, my lock journey, this is my second lock journey, and this lock journey has been 100% um, preform. And so I intentionally do nothing. I've done nothing. I, my hair has done exactly what it wants to do and is becoming what it wants to be. And it's probably the most free and beautiful part of myself. But they say still, no, 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 but you must have twisted it. You must have done something. Did you put some like beeswax in it? What did, what did you do to it to make it be itself? And I just, you know, I'll just say it again, nothing. And it actually became a little, a little bit of a, let's say a site-specific performance piece, or a site-responsive performance piece, because this happened so many hundreds of times, and I would just say, nothing, nothing. And then I finally figured out a refrain that would really bring the thing into coherence. And it was, you know, this is what happens when you leave the black body, the fuck alone. <laughs> we have some time, some space to be our beautiful, brilliant selves. So I'm glad, I'm glad you were able to bear witness. But yeah, uh, still incredulous, they walk away. So that's a sense of peace in the body, to be oneself, you know, sort of echoing um, Roger's insights from Arendt. Um, my hair, my grandfather's funeral. I have photos, folks. But there's no click or something. I'm having to be a little, no, 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 no. You're missing the first few slides. They're not important. They're not important. They're perfunctory. You already know that, I said that. There's a picture of me with my locks. That's in Brooklyn, quarantine. All right, and now we're caught up. My grandfather, Victor Mills, Victor D. Mills, born in a sharecropping community called Union Mills, North Carolina, outside Asheville. Um, beautiful human being, you know, one of the loves of my life. Um, worked, you know, worked his way. He was part of what people call the Great Migration, FYI. There have been many migrations of black folk in this country, but that was a great one. Um, and he moved up north like many people, worked from like being a dishwasher to being the maitre d' and then the manager of the Cleveland Clinic Inn, if you know this uh, hotel, uh, serving royalty. He even had his own television cooking show. Um, so this is him appearing on television. So this is, you know, before, it was, it, before Emerald and all that. He had a, a show, a spot, and he's just an elegant, beautiful, incredible human being. It's him with his son who also became a chef. Uh, that's him with his love, who's now 90, 96. And this is me burying him, Victor Mills. Uh, at his funeral, I learned something about him that I had not known. One is that he read poetry, and that his favorite poem was one that I had not encountered or, or heard of the writer. Uh, his favorite poem I read at the funeral, and I'll just give you a bit of it. What is this life? If full of care, we have no time to stop and stare. And it tore me apart <laughs> to, you know, to read those words, thinking of his, the entirety of his life. Is that, is that what he understood? Is that what his generation understood? No leisure. Leisure is not, there was no time <laughs> for contemplation. It, it, it was heavy for me to realize this. Um, my grandfather. The third part is my experience in Brooklyn, 2020. So I came across this photo in, around the spring of, spring of 2020, I think still in quarantine in Brooklyn. Uh, outside my door was actually a park, which was the starting point for some marches, which were part of a global, as you may remember, the largest, actually, black liberation movement in the history. Um, the juxtaposition, this is my family, pretty much like my dad right there with the, with the small afro on the sideburns. That's my father. That's pretty much everyone they knew, their friends, aunties, children, grandparents, everybody trying to resist and oppose white supremacy, speaking out against white supremacy. I mean, these are doctors, lawyers, these are you know, teachers, these are funeral home owners, these are just folk, the folk, the people fighting for their lives. Now, the juxtaposition of me finding this photograph, and then literally outside my door, I'm filming every single day 
police violence, you know, every day with my phone, every day bearing witness, every day writing letters, every day, you know, the juxtaposition of those two things became absolutely untenable to me. And there was a sort of incoherence in my, in my, my linear sense of things, right? Uh, I could not, let's say some part of my imagination, could not, could not imagine successive generations, which I'm seeing, I'm seeing myself in this because it's like almost like before I'm born, so I'm included in this photo, successive generations fighting for basic rights, a cup of coffee and a hamburger, you know, the, the basic right to be oneself uh, and become oneself. How am I doing on time? Okay, yeah, cool, cool. Um, so yeah, it became untenable for me to imagine myself in that sort of lineage of striving, especially for the basics. Uh, I began to ask the question, if we cannot imagine futures that provide access to leisure, repose, solitude, joy, then what is the nature of the freedom we are seeking with the liberation movement? And I began to ask this question when I was sort of elbow deep in you know, all the many institutional responses um, and other kinds of work that was happening uh, during that, that period. Uh, I began to ask myself what other kinds of imaginations are required to be cultivated in order to have a future that manifests not only the possibility but the expectation of repose, of solitude. I begin to think, I don't think I'm interested in a, a liberation movement that's not going to advance that or at least prioritize it. I begin to think of solitude as a fundamentally central indicator of liberation and freedom, the presence of justice. I often used to say joy is the goal of justice and love is the work but I really have been featuring solitude, access to it. Solitude, that imperturbability of one's subjecthood, uh, to me is the essence, uh, and a fundamental principle, requirement even, for just society and its citizens. So I began to walk around Brooklyn during the quarantine, trying to take a walk, and I began to try to think, like these are the folk, these children, <laughs> these old folk, these people, these are the folk that literally, there's helicopters going over, you know, watching that and, you know, bearing, you know, bearing witness to that and um, in, making incursions into that space. Those children, those are the problematized bodies. So I'm just walking around looking for signs of solitude. And I began to capture images of young black folk. Um, I was in Bed-Stuy, Bed great community. Um, just capture images of young black people who were daily being targeted at that time and continually, trying to myself cultivate an imagination of their solitude. And to find really a little bit of hope, I ran into two individuals who were teaching themselves how to skateboard for the first time. Uh, these, you know, I would say they're like young adults. Um, each of them teaching themselves by themselves how to skateboard. They allowed me to photograph them. And it, it, it was almost, it was a contemplative space. It was a joyful space. It was a deep solitude. Um, kind of taking it up late in life, occasioned by the quarantine. Here's one of them named Dev. I had to cut some of these images just because we've got such wonderful light in this room. So I, I'm giving you the bright ones. Two boys sharing an AirPod. Um, now these are the exact sort of beautiful people who could at any moment really experience a, a, an absolute disruption of this kind of moment, but you know, they're sharing, one of them is, is sharing some music with the other. They're out of the earshot, importantly, of adults, right? They're outside so they can be safe. I think this is before the uh, vaccinations. You know, God, finding for themselves this moment of solitude, shared solitude. 
some kid had moved, <laughs> showed up in front of my door, he, from, uh, from Atlanta. He's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here to skate. <laughs> he was here to skate on my street from Atlanta. I'm like, okay, 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 do it, do it. Do you mind if I photograph? <laughs> the joy was insane. I, the joy was immeasurable with this kid. So I started to think about uh, play spaces and noticed, right, with the quarantine, all those spaces, all the spaces that were, of play had been vacated. So what was I noticing in their absence? And what was the absence, the, what was the presence in the absence sort of speaking? Um, some of these spaces of play and realizing how many were actually designed into the neighborhood, just places of solitude, play, leisure, fun. Thinking about sites of play. And how contributive they are to the, the imagination um, and the schema of the daily life there. I've been thinking along with this how with solitude, so much of interiority, particularly when I think of like black folk, black interiority is so hidden and even overlooked to the point where I think some people may not be aware that it exists, <laughs> that these sort of cultural forms and you know, idioms just appear from, from, from nowhere whatsoever. Um, but spaces of play, uh, nostalgia, memory, just trying to capture these senses and understand what are the formative uh, you know, and generative elements that that again sustain that sense of subjectivity and, and create a solitude that is full, fulsome. I started thinking about, this is stuff from my own table, I started thinking about quotidian luxuries, the ways in which uh, interiority can be sort of um, you know, aided by just little, little touches that you can add, little fresh things, carnations, the flower looked down upon by all florists. I think it's a glorious little flower. Uh, so I have carnations all through all my spaces. It's my studio flower. It's my home flower. <laughs> but just little settings, you know, I'm wondering how many people have the opportunity to take a moment to uh, attend to quotidian luxuries and how important that is for the cultivation of solitude and interiority. These are just plates and things we were doing in quarantine. I began to want to see lyrical bodies. I wanted to see black bodies and lyricism. I started to fantasize and think about um, what if we did a redux of Gene Kelly's famous solo in Singing in the Rain. You know, I want everyone to experience this. At the end of his solo, right, an actual police officer comes out. It's just, you know, he's dancing the rain. And the police officer's there just like, what are you doing? How can you be behaving this way? What is this behavior? It's the rain, why aren't you, you know, why? And he just goes, you know, I'm like, this is the particular embodiment I want for all black people, that we can <laughs> be ourselves so much that even the, the state has to just say, oh, I, I encourage your joy. So we did redo it and uh, replaced Gene Kelly with uh, the, the, the great Kayla Farish, a wonderful dance maker and choreographer in New York City, recently won a Bessie for her work, and Saul Williams, um, mother, motherboard ship, mother, mothership board. I will have to find out the name of that piece. Uh, but this is Kayla dancing her own singing in the rain. We replaced the music with Bob Marley's um, Satisfy My Soul. Yeah, I think one minute. Yeah, I think I'm, I, I, I wanted to share this uh, notion of lyricism because, because I think in what I'm seeking in lyricism, it assumes all these things. It assumes interiority, it assumes um, the subjectivity that is able to be uh, undisrupted, unperturbed. I really think that that's what solitude can provide. And I think it's a requirement if we want to see a just future and one where liberation is manifested.
we'll see if we can do it, and then and then Richard will come up. So Kenyon, thank you. Um, really, uh, really beautiful and wonderful um, meditation on solitude. I want to ask. I want to complicate solitude in 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 a way. Um, Arendt uh, distinguishes three different ideas: solitude, isolation, and loneliness. Um, loneliness being a kind of an abandonment, a feeling of utter non-meaninglessness, and it's actually modern feelings of mass loneliness that she thinks leads to people joining movements that become totalitarian movements and things of that sort. Isolation is, 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 is different, right? It's isolation is when you're just at home alone, but you can still have friends, you can still have people over, you can talk about how much you hate Putin or Trump or whatever, but as long as you don't act in public, you're okay. And then solitude is something different for her. It's, it's actually how you think. It's the two in one. It's where you have a conversation with yourself. And when I try and ask, what is Kenyon talking about? I'm actually not sure it fits in any one of those three. I don't think it's thought, necessarily. I don't think it's loneliness, abandonment. And I don't think it's isolation. So I'm just wondering where you, you, know, you use the word solitude. How you, how you think of it, maybe in, the, in that triad, where does it fit or not fit? No, thank you. I, I love that distinction. Like a, a lot of times when I'm talking about solitude, especially in liberation, you know, in re relation to liberation, people say, well, um, they seem to conflate isolation and solitude. So usually the first thing I have to say is, well, I, like Arendt, I want to separate out isolation. The reason for this also is because of, you know, multiple generations of mass incarceration have, have created a kind of solitude. And I actually mean people, young people, being in isolation. It's a big part of our culture to, to you know, punish by isolating. And it's so much a part of the imaginative landscape, especially uh, in the arts, that you can't talk about solitude and people don't start thinking about prison. So I have done a lot of thinking of that, and it's actually thinking about isolation as a kind of violence, that isolation, um, I think of it as a violence in that, certainly in that context, but almost in general, whereas solitude I think is formative. I'm coming from a contemplative view of solitude, um, which is a formation uh, related to formation of selfhood. Um, I'm really deeply influenced by Howard Thurman, the contemplative who also famously was the mentor of Martin Luther King Jr., gave the eulogy for King. Um, it was a great mystic, great American mystic um, and theologian. Um, I think officially a mystical theologian. But Thurman, you know, really tried to push, and I heard this earlier in one of our conversations, and I just I want to um, give it an amen. The distinction, I think it was Esther Perel that it was sort of pointing this, the distinction between the inner and the outer is a serious problem. It's an, it's an extreme problem. It could be one of the major problems. That making, making a distinction as though they're not related. The, even the ability to do that is a serious problem. For, um, for Thurman, he said anyone, anything, and any idea that sets itself up to separate and deny the relationship between the inner and the outer, the, uh, the contemplation and the action, and you could relate that to Arendtian terms, is against life, that's what he says, and that's his sort of my impression of Thurman. It's against life. And he means life force. He means it's against all of life and all things um, continuing. And so I, I try to imbue solitude with that kind of um, weight and say, you know, in, in solitude, uh, and I do believe also you mentioned this notion of being in community. I do think solitude is a kind of, can be a kind of being in community. But it's, it's centering that in the possibility of selfhood and subjectivity 